us for what we are really thrilled to be here with a very special guest who's going to be going to be talking about ecology and the contestation of ecology. People might think, okay, well, you're a podcast about the far right, so what's that got to do with it? And it's really important to know that there is a very far right reactionary contestation of the idea of ecology. Nature is, of course, a hugely open concept that more or less anyone can uh, appropriate for their use, uh, more or less anyone can assert that their politics follows the laws of nature. And that's happened most, I think, intensely uh, on the far right. Uh, there are other places, of course, where it's happened as well. And uh, our, our guest today is one of the people who's kind of been most involved in um, trying to describe that, that contestation the process of contesting the concept of nature um, on the far right, but also suggesting ways in which the uh, the left can can also use these these um, uh, concepts. So, um, without further ado, uh, I'm really happy for you to introduce yourself. Tell us who are you? You got it. Thanks for having me, Sam. My name is Peter Staudenmeyer. I am a historian. I'm, I'm from the United States, as you can hear from my accent. I've spent a lot of my adult life in Germany, been very involved in activist projects, both in North America and in Germany, in the anarchist movement and the ecology movement, the radical environmentalist movement. In my professional work as a, as a historian, one of the several things I study is the relatively unknown history of far-right entanglements with environmental politics. Yeah, you wrote a, and, and the, 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 I think probably the thing that um, people would know you best for, uh, maybe you uh, don't think this, but the, one, the thing I know you best for, at least, is an essay called Fascist Ecology, um, which is was in a book called Ecofascism, uh, which was co-authored with Janet Beale. Um, yeah. And let's kind of go through that essay, because it's a really important essay in understanding these, um, these dynamics. So you start your history of reactionary ecology um, with Ernst Morris Arndt, who is a, um, in 1815, I think, writes a book on yep. the care of preservation of forests. Um, I wonder, I'm kind of interested in that beginning. What is the preconditions for that reactionary form of ecology? What is the preconditions that predates the 18, uh, early 1800s? How are both, I guess, on the one hand, nature being refigured in politics, and how is politics opening up to refigure these I guess, kind of reactionary movements um, in the in the um, early 1800s. That's a great question. Art is a is a fascinating figure. I give him uh, a little bit of space in that in that essay from 26 years ago now, whenever that book came out. Um, but he's I don't I don't do him justice, of course, because I'm I'm interested in one strand in his thought. But the the really intriguing thing about his uh, about Art's form of hyper nationalism in that in that German context in the early years of the 19th century is that it's not necessarily reactionary in the sense that we normally mean in fact you could almost say it the other way around you might say that many forms of German nationalism for that that period from let's say to make it simple the first half of the 19th century you might say that a lot of forms of German nationalism during that historical period had strongly progressive elements within them. It's, it's not accidental that stuff like this comes from German thinkers circa 1815, that's right in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars, when, when Germans are, are starting to finally think of themselves as Germans. There is no Germany in 1815. Germany as a, as a country isn't unified until 1870, 1871. So um, it's an interesting time to look at those dynamics of rising nationalism. What's really fascinating, in my view, about uh, people like Arndt and others, and, and, and Wilhelm Reinhardt Real, who I talk about a little later in the essay, who comes more in the myth, an early form of environmental concern. Their, their focus is both on the health and purity of the German people and on the health and purity of the German landscape. And that's a really important connection that becomes especially crucial once we move into the 20th century. What, is, what does health mean there? So um, health, of course, uh, I mean, we're living in through a pandemic. Everyone knows what kind of health is, public health measures. People and, understand that it becomes much more, it's become much more to the fore, obviously, in the, in the last year. But when we're talking about health in the early 19th century, is, is vigor a main part of it? Is balance a part of it? Is purity a part of it? Because these are all in some ways like contested forms of health. And you might even say that in the contemporary period, things like purity in particular are much more likely to be associated with not necessarily kind of reactionary politics or reactionary ideas of nature, but 
at least are deployed in that way? The health of the German nation and the health of nature, what does that contain? That's a great question. It, it, it has all three of the elements that, that, that you mentioned, balance, vigor, purity. Th- those are crucial. As I, was, as I would say, especially the last one, pu- purity is a is a really is a, is a big theme for these thinkers, but there's more to it. There's a there's a sense of wholesomeness, which is a, a word that in English is sort of it, it feels related to the notion of health being health and whole and hale and hearty. Um, and there's also a sense of healing. the The idea here is not just maintaining your vigor and your health, but the idea is something has gone wrong in our society. Something has, for, for these thinkers, something has gone wrong with modernity as such. Modern life as a whole for them is a, is, a, is a great big bundle of problems. And they think that many aspects of modern society have left these damaging marks on what they view as traditional natural communities. So we need to, and their, from their perspective, we need to heal from the ills that modernity has inflicted on us. And that's an important aspect of that notion of health. It's not just maintaining health, but in fact, returning to a supposed previous state of being healthy. And that's that's the case, not just for a particular class, but it's also the case for a whole people. The nation so as a whole. Yeah. So how does how does that how does that notion of having to return to a kind of pre modern state um, work on the national level? What kind of what kind of practices can people do on a national level in this period, um, and maybe even kind of later into kind of uh, more like I guess like more generalized kind of volkish politics? What kind of practices can people do that will restore this balance to nature? Are we talking about walking in a forest? Are we talking about a particular kind of farming? How are we thinking about like the kind of technologies by which we interface with nature in a way that makes us pure, makes us whole, makes us heal. Right. A lot of it is things like walking in forests, as, as trivializing as that might sound, especially from a German perspective, that's a, that's a big deal. Being able to reestablish your connection or your supposed people's connection with these landscapes that have taken on almost a kind of sacred meaning, whether that's uh, mountain landscapes, whether it's just forests, Germany, Germany today, even still today in the 21st century, Germany is full of beautiful forested, wooded landscapes. And a lot of Germans quite legitimately uh, th- think that's really important to, to respect and to retain. So for some of these earlier thinkers, sure, having, a, having, a, having the ability to personally interact with the natural world that was going to be a huge part of their conception of returning the people as a whole, returning the nation as a whole to a kind of health. You mentioned folkish politics, which is this term that's effectively impossible to translate into English, no matter how hard we try. That's, that's where a lot of that notion comes from. By the time you get to the late 19th century, and then in the early years of the 20th century, that's when things like the Folkish phenomenon really start to take off because a lot of those earlier themes that people like aren't in real that they've already been developing for a century beforehand. By the time you get to around 1900, those themes have become urgent. They've become acute for millions of Germans with the extremely rapid rise of urbanization, industrialization, those things start to make a lot of Germans step back and say, wait, what kind of a world are we moving into here? And what are we losing along the way? Do you think it's a particularly German phenomenon? I'm thinking about particularly kind of the US context. So obviously, in the US context, we have this, the wilderness appreciation is a, is a thing at this time. Um, oh, yeah. And, but there's obviously a very different context there. And there's partially a different context, because there's just been a genocide. Uh, or not, not just being just, I think that's kind of an ongoing series. Ongoing, yeah. yeah. So w- how does that change, do you think, outside the German context? Or is it is it actually quite particular, this Volkish politics, to Germany in that sense? I do not think it is specific to Germany. Uh, so, some, some scholars do, for, for what it's worth. I don't. I, I think that there are uh, particular strands that are recognizably, that, that fit well into a German historical context. But I see these same themes playing themselves out in a British context, certainly in a US context, I think probably also in French and Russian contexts. That's where my own, that's where the, that's where we reach the edges of my own competence. <laughs> so I can't say for sure in those, in those cases, but I, I have a strong suspicion that they're also present there. I, I think these are the sorts of things that you could probably trace throughout 
a, at the very least throughout Western societies, possibly also non-Western societies that are, that are crossing that threshold from whatever you want to call the societies before the rise of full capitalist and statist forms of modernity into their full, their fullest 20th century expression. While you're making that transition, I see these same sets of themes recurring. Now there are specifically American strands of them and specifically German strands of them, but I would say they have a lot in common as well. You might even say, I mean, I, this is again uh, reaching the edges of my confidence, <laughs> my confidence as well. Um, that in say contemporary India, um, where we see well, Modi and so on, there is the same kind of contestation of the idea of ecology, the idea of spiritual purity, the idea of nature going on, mm -hmm. particularly in relation between like the Modi government and the kind of majoritarian Hinduism that he's uh, propagating and the uh, the Muslim community in India. Um, and of course, the, the kind of triple contestation there, which is also the contestation with. Uh, British colonialism. And it's That's just, right, exactly, yep. I'm, I'm wondering, how does the, let's talk about, so in that case, in the, the Indian case, um, there's a very clearly sense of an other um, in the kind of sociological sense, like an outgroup um, that is not you, that is both kind of inside the nation and also kind of not rightfully inside the nation. So in right. India, it's, um, for Hindu nationalists, it's Muslims. In, in, in the 19th century in Germany, this is presumably Jews. Yeah. Uh, so, so, among others, Jews and Slavs, I right. would say. Yeah, so I'm kind, of, I'm kind of wondering, do you think that it's possible to constitute a Volkish politics? Not that I'm planning to. Do you think it's possible to constitute a Volkish politics without producing this kind of, um, you know, this this like otherized, internal other? yeah, internal other? I think you probably need some version of, of an internal other to, to, to get a full on active form of Volkish politics. You do have to have some group like that. The thing is, it's not hard to find those groups in virtually any society. Um, that it's it, that that again is not specific to South Asia. Certainly not specific to uh, German-speaking Europe. We we happen to have two really sharply drawn examples there. Where in both cases, by the way, there's also a potential religious uh, divide for 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 late 19th century Germans Jews to the extent that Jews were readily distinguishable from non-Jewish Germans, which, which was increasingly hard for many Germans to do during that period. One of the main uh, axes of distinction was precisely religion. What, what house of worship do they go to on which day of the week? That would be one of the few ways you might be able to tell uh, a non-Jewish German from a, from a Jewish German during that historical period. So religious factors, which, which for a lot of people, we now, from 21st century perspective, some folks tend to think of religious differences as, as a relic of the past. I think that's a mistake. Th those sorts of differences get constantly re reworked. They get re-articulated, if you will, in each new historical period. And you might see the rise of Central European forms of anti-Semitism as, among other things, a reworking of some of those previous traditional uh, inter-religious forms of othering and xenophobia. To what extent does this, do, the, do these groups, the Homeland Protection Movement and so on, um, right. who are kind of politically organized forms of these like nature uh, right. kind of engagements, to what extent do they constitute the, the, the basis for fascism? To some extent, but I, I wouldn't overstate that. The, for, for one thing, those, um, the, the, men, the movement you just mentioned, so-called Homeland Protection, it's, an, it's another one of those German words that's hard to translate, Heimat. Heimat can mean many, many, many things, but it often, especially in its turn of the century, turn of the 20th century German contexts, Heimat often had a much stronger set of regional and local associations. It was in tension with the strong national uh, uh, approach of a group like the Nazis. Keep, keep in mind the the, 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 the name the Nazis gave themselves was the National Socialist German Workers' Party. We would, everyone on the left would do well to remind themselves that that's the, that's the actual name of the Nazi party. From a Nazi point of view, some of those regional and local identities were uh, a kind of a diversion. They were kind of a, a waste of time. And a lot of Nazis much strongly preferred to say, for, forget about the local region you, you live in. What we care about is transforming the entire national community, which was, their, which was a, a term that the Nazis adopted for themselves. So there are definitely um, any number of 
connections, both ideological and, and personal connections between members of the Heimatschutzbewegung, the, the, the movement for protecting the homeland, uh, and the later Nazi movement. You can trace you know, biographical continuities there and ideological continuities, but I, I don't think we want to overstate them. They occupied different class positions, for one thing, and they were focused on different, different forms of Germanness, different senses of what it means to belong to a community. That's very interesting. That's really, really fascinating. Um, so they had these different class positions and they had different senses of how Germany was motivated, it was mobilized. For, so Dylan Riley has this uh, concept of fascism, which I've referred to on the past in this podcast, uh, in the series of foundations of fascism, that it requires this kind of um, mass form. It requires a, 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 a mass associational politics that can imminently, um, without kind of mediating force, seem to kind of take on the mantle of um the people and therefore rule in its in its image um, without going through the kind of liberal democratic um, trials and tribulations of, for example, elections right. and so on. To what extent is is like the politics of a kind of natural community expressed in that attempt to imminently take take the state as one's kind of possession as the nation? Um, it's a great question. The, it, that, that's one of the ways in which Dylan Riley's theory, which, which is a fascinating and very provocative theory, the, the notion of fascism yeah. <laughs> as participatory is a, is a really useful challenge to a lot of the inherited. He describes it as a democracy. Um, he says it, it's a form of democracy. It's an authoritarian form of democracy. And th there's, I'm just going to tell this to our listeners, like there's, a, there's a moment in the preface to the second edition. And obviously he's coming for a lot of criticism for describing fascism as democracy. Sure. And yep. in the preface to the second edition, he simply dismisses this entire criticism on the basis that this criticism of his use of the term democracy to describe fascism is simply kind of crypto ideological sociologists um, who have a kind of vested interest in a certain notion of democracy. And he says, no, it's essentially contested. You can't like decide that something is not democratic. Um, anyway, sorry, that's a kind of a side. Yeah. Sorry. You were kind yeah. of oh, he's got a point. It's uh, I don't I don't fully subscribe to a lot of uh, his analysis, but still, it's a good provocative way of rethinking traditional concepts of fascism. So if we, if we follow that uh, analysis, it once again runs into some tensions with some of the groups you and I were talking about, those early 20th century nature protection, homeland protection groups. Those were not groups that saw themselves as mass movements. On the contrary, they saw themselves as specifically bourgeois movements. They thought that their own class or classes, the, the people, the strata of society that they, that they belong to themselves and that they thought they legitimately represented, they thought those strata were the ones who were called upon to look after the German landscape as a whole. They did not think that people who were spending their days working in factories could would have the opportunity to develop that sort of personal connection with the landscape that would allow you to then uh, respect its own cycles and its own rhythms. So they had a much more, I would say that many of the early nature protection and homeland protection folks, at least in a German context, they had a much more restrictive sense of who even counts as, quote, the people, end quote, in the first place. When the Nazis come along, they radically expand that. They're, that's one way in which Dylan Riley's analysis is really onto something. Groups like the Nazis, and in a different way, the Italian fascists, they take a much broader approach to, no, no, the people is really the whole people, and we need to include all of them. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. And it also plays out kind of quite well in the American context, right, where you get people oh, yeah. like Madison Grant, for example, who is a real patrician character insofar exactly. as American has an aristocracy. And Madison Grant is a member of that aristocracy. And it right. even plays out in the Italian context between uh, the tensions between, for example, Evola, who describes himself as a traditionalist, yep. and the broader plebeian, always kind of like, you know, yep. Evola regards people in the fascist party as kind of scum. He's like, oh, these people, these people are just like... <laughs> Yeah, they're, 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 sure, sure, they have the right kind of beliefs, but like they don't praise me enough. I, you know, they're not aristocratic enough. Um, it's a really interesting, fascinating dynamic. I mean, Evola has a book called Fascism Viewed from the Right. So now we, we're kind of, we've got to the point where we've, we've constituted the Nazi party and the Nazis are even in power. And you get figures like Richard Watadare, um, who's the sure. popularizer of a kind of a, a blood and soil uh, idea of, of fascism. How does he play out in the history of um, the Nazi party? Uh, made kind of a leader of the peasant. Uh, of the food, the food estate, um, okay. which is a you know, hugely important part, and it's trying to resolve these kind of contradictions between, um, for example, the demands of producers and the demands of consumers, and so on. 
we might say this is an ill-fated project, given that these are it in was. a capitalist society objectively in, in contradiction, and they simply cannot be resolved the contradictions. So maybe he was kind of ill-fated from the start, but he doesn't. But he, eventually, he is essentially stripped of all his posts. What, how is significant is this project? The way that Richard Evans writes about it is that it's mm -hmm. a um, attempt to kind of undermine the hierarchy of the countryside. Right. So. Hindenburg, for example, has this um, is is one of the kind of the landed uh, gentry or not landed gentry, maybe the kind of aristocracy. It commands like a huge estate, and the Nazis are trying to kind of break these up and like, give them back to the peasants. So, how does the kind of dynamics of like this interclass contradiction um, between that you would the interclass tension that you would describe between the Nazis and the kind of more patrician or more like bourgeois nature protection movement? How does this play out in particularly the case of like Walter Dare and so on? Dare is a, a, a perfect case study in exactly those contradictions. It's not just that he and his wing of the Nazi party, it's not just they wanted to, uh, you know, to challenge the existing uh, uh, relations of the, the gentry and the aristocracy in the countryside. They wanted to completely overturn those relationships. Now, by the way, I would, I would not say that the Nazis as a whole wanted to break up the large estates. In fact, they, they rarely did break up the, the large estates once they were in power. That's one of the contradictions that runs straight through the, the heart of the Nazi movement as a whole. There were some Nazis who took the anti-capitalist rhetoric seriously and who basically meant it. And there were other Nazis for whom it was more or less a handy way to get enough support to get into power. And once you were in power, you tossed it aside. Um, so it's not, I wouldn't say there was a position of, of the Nazis as such on any of these questions. But uh, Dare himself is a great example of a historical figure who was in the right place at the right time. For most of the 1920s, he's not a Nazi. In fact, for a while, he's associated with another far right party, the German Nationalist People's Party, um, which is sort of a, at sometimes an ally, at sometimes a rival to the Nazis. And he doesn't get, he doesn't actually join the Nazi party until the middle of 1930, which is interesting timing. That's three years before the Nazis come to power, but it's after the point where they've started to really uh, rise in the polls, so to speak. And Dare ends up playing a really important role in that rise. He is often credited, I think more or less accurately credited with playing a crucial role part in getting large chunks of the German peasantry, large, many, many small German farmers to uh, swing toward the Nazis and start giving their votes toward the Nazis. And the reason he's able to do that is because the agrarian depression has hit Germany so fantastically hard, starting even before the Great Depression, that the, the agrarian crisis in Germany starts roughly 1926, when the stock market collapses in late 1928, and then moving into early 1929, all hell breaks loose across the German farming sector. So Dare is, is the right guy at the right historical moment. He's able to capitalize on this desperate sense within the German peasantry of whatever, whatever we've been doing before, politically speaking, has not worked. And if these Nazis come along, whoever they are, and they say, we're for the peasantry, even though they seem suspiciously urban to us, maybe we should throw in our lot with them. So Dore is very successful in those uh, first few years of his joining the Nazi party. When the Nazis come to power in 1933, it takes a few months. He's not immediately made uh, uh, agriculture uh, minister, but he is eventually made agriculture minister after, after Hitler has started to consolidate his power within six months or so. Put in charge of the Reich food estate, which you also mentioned he's named Reich peasant leader. That's one of his many titles. And he's trying to oversee this, this sort of uh, uh, far-flung agrarian apparatus that is supposed to, it never quite does this, but it's supposed to regulate every aspect of the agrarian economy, not just the producers, but marketing and uh, all of those things. And for a while, Dare does okay. I would say he's sort of hitting his peak around 1934, 1935. And then after that, he starts to more or less steadily lose power, including lo losing power to his own underling, his own is one of his right-hand men, a guy named Baca, Herbert Baca, uh, who's initially Dare's deputy. He's the one who eventually takes over. After 1942, Dare is more or less dismissed. He's technically not, Dare is technically never fired. Technically, Dare remains Minister of Agriculture until 1945. In fact, he still gets his salary for those last three years, but he's completely kicked out of power and Baca is put in power. So we have a few years there where we can look at what Dare does 
and what Dare says in public. And then as a third element, what does Dare tell his closest collaborators, the people, not people like Baca, who's, who, who soon becomes a rival and, and an enemy, but the people who remain loyal to Dare within the agricultural apparatus. And that story gets genuinely complicated. The version that a lot of us have learned was through Anna Bramwell's, but she, she was the first one to even write a, a full book long, length study of Dare back in the 1980s. And she, she called him the father of the Greens at, at the one point. So a lot of us have learned that history through this unfortunately highly distorted lens that Bramwell brought to her portrait of Dare. In reality, Dare took a long time to even become a convert to organic farming. That doesn't really happen until 1939. So you've got a couple of years between, say, 1939 and 1942 when he's completely kicked out of power, where he tries to extend some official support to some of those early organic farming movements in Germany. But that's a relatively short period, given the 12 year length of the Nazi regime as a whole. I want to go back to this kind of this crisis um, in 1926, the German. Sure. So this is, so what are the sources of the crisis and how are the sources of the crisis understood? Because there's a kind of a, um, a moment, I forget exactly the year, when um, Hitler makes a kind of transformation in the, um, the party's constitution. Initially, it had a, um, a policy of um, taking, uh, that it would split up larger states and it would, that it would give them back to the peasants. Um, That's right. And then he decides to specify, oh, no, we just mean Jewish estates. Right. And so he has to try to resolve this kind of class conflict between himself and these, the, uh, the, the landed bourgeoisie or the landed aristocracy even. That's right. So to what extent is the crisis of 26 and then the going kind of haywire after the Great Depression, to what extent is this seen as being triggered amongst the German peasantry by a Jewish plot, Jewish conspiracy, and so on. And how does anti-Semitism play into this kind of, um, yeah, peasant politics? At the time? Excellent question. Yeah, a, a lot of German peasants at the time, pe peasants, by the way, is a strange term, but we use that in English because it's the best translation we have for the, for the German term, which is simply Bauer. But really that word means farmer. So to the extent that there is a, a, a difference in connotation in English between a peasant and a farmer, maybe we should be talking about farmers in this context, but whatever, that's, that's become the term that's established uh, itself in discussions of the Nazi period and of the 1920s. The, a lot of those German peasants are farmers. They, they knew Jews professionally, but they didn't know them as owners of the estate. When, when, when Hitler says we're only talking about Jewish owners of estates, who the hell is he talking about? What Jewish owners of what agrarian estates? For most of European history, Jews weren't allowed to own land. They didn't own any, any estates. The whole notion is, is preposterous. And a lot of Nazi anti-Semites are fully aware that it's preposterous. That's, that, the, the facts have never stopped anti-Semites from sending a myth out into the world. The ways that German farmers did actually interact with Jews would have been through uh, things like uh, cattle traders, for example. If you're a cattle farmer and you want to get your stock to market, once you get to the early part of the 20th century, you can't just you know, do that on your own and walk them down to the local village marketplace, et cetera. You're going to work through a, uh, a middle person uh, uh, operator. And a lot of those cattle traders in parts of Germany, Southwest Germany, for example, a lot of them happen to be Jews. Um, sometimes the people who were going to get you the gear you needed to keep your estate running, whatever, whatever the particular uh, items you were that you couldn't grow and make on site, a lot of times that might come through a peddler and that peddler might be Jewish, depending on where and when, what decade and what part of Germany we're looking at. So sure, German farmers had had professional contacts with Jews. Maybe the veterinarian was Jewish. Maybe the local human doctor, the doctor for, for humans was Jewish. Who knows? Um, so there are any number of uh, connections there, but it wouldn't make sense from a German farmer's point of view to blame their plight from 1926 onward on Jews. That only becomes meaningful once you have a political force that's out there spreading this consistent message, hammering away at this message that the Jews are our misfortune, which was a classic anti-Semitic phrase. The Nazis did not coin that phrase. They picked it up from the late 19th century and took it and ran with it. Once you have a political force that's telling everybody 
the Jews are the ones who are at fault here. And you have a class of people, a group of people, a group of farmers who are genuinely facing economic ruin. That was not, they were not imagining that. They were in severe straits at that time. When you have those two factors together and nobody else has a coherent explanation to offer, the communists aren't offering much of any explanation at all from what's going on in the agrarian crisis. They're much more focused on uh, urban groups. The social Democrats have a sort of wishy-washy and mixed and ambiguous message. The liberals couldn't give a shit, pardon my French, that when, when, there's, when there's that vacuum there, when you don't have a, a radical left alternative with an articulated message that regular farmers can understand, by almost by default, that vacuum is going to get sucked up by a group like the Nazis, who says, don't worry about trying to understand international commodity markets. Don't worry about trying to understand the relationship between your debt load and the underlying value of the uh, real property that you own. Don't worry about all that complicated nonsense. We've got a really simple explanation for you. It's the Jews' fault. And that becomes really attractive to a lot of farmers, the worse and worse the crisis gets. How does, what's the tension here? Is there a tension here between a, a nature politics, um, a nation built on nature politics, and a drive to conquest? Is there a tension? Are they two things simply same parts of the uh, same ideology? Um, yeah, how does that play out? There are both tensions and uh, enormous areas of overlap and convergence, and they're both going on at the, at the exact same time. The tensions arise around things like where should we be focused if, if we're the Nazis and we're supposedly running this massive modern economy? And again, I say supposedly, you yourself recognized a few minutes ago that Dore, even with all of his nominal powers, even though he supposedly is in charge of the right food estate, which is theoretically supposed to be running the entire agrarian economy, he's trying, he and his uh, staff are trying to regulate things and run things, but they are only halfway succeeding, uh, if even that. So if you're, a, if you're a top level Nazi planning official and you're facing a question like this, who are we gonna privilege within this uh, rapidly heating up economy, the, the economy that's finally getting back on its legs after having been uh, crippled by the, first by the inflation in the early part of the Weimar years and then by the, it's like a one-two punch of hyperinflation and then half a decade later, this collapse of the international capitalist financial markets. Um, so the German economy is heating up again and getting back on its feet, but where are we going to direct it to? Are we going to make things easier for urban-based industrial workers? Are we going to make their food prices lower? Or are we going to make things easier for rural-based agrarian producers? Are we going to make their prices, the prices that they get higher, which would make it impossible to lower the prices that the urban consumers are paying for their food? Those are those are challenging questions for any any attempt to at a, at a planned economy in those sort of highly modernized circumstances. In Germany in the 1930s was a highly modernized country. It had, it, had a, it had a massive agrarian sector, but in many ways it was almost at a cutting edge in, in terms of international comparisons. So someone like Dare, even before his conversion to organic farming, which like I said, doesn't really kick in until the, the end of the 1930s. Even before then, Dare is strongly committed to doing whatever he can in his post as minister and as Reich peasant leader, doing whatever he can to make things better for rural communities, in part because he desperately wants to stem the demographic tide. One of his, one of his worst fears is that more and more young people who grow up in rural areas are going to leave their rural communities, not become good peasant stock, not become good farmers tied to the land, but instead they're going to flow out to the urban centers where there are lots of jobs, they're going to work in factories, and they'll be from Dare's uh, point of view, they'll be lost to the, to the cause. And he tries everything he can think of to, to stem that outflow of young people from rural areas. There's, 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 a, there's a one word term for that phenomenon in German, Landflucht, the fleeing from the land, fleeing from rural areas. And Dare is terrible at stopping it. Not because he's not trying, but everything he tries ends up doing exactly the wrong thing. It ends up exacerbating the problem rather than uh, sort of uh, modifying the problem. So he's trying to do things right as he sees it by rural communities, but he's basically failing. And there's whole other factions of the Nazis who basically couldn't care what's going on in rural communities who are much more focused on what they see as the, the lively advancing future 
of uh, the great German nation, and they see that as the, the beating heart of the industrial uh, 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 workers and companies and corporations and so on and so forth. So there's all sorts of tensions there. Do we throw our resources into making more tanks, to building planes, to building up an army, even though by our international agreements, we're not really allowed to, or are we gonna do it anyway? The way in which there is a kind of convergence there, and this helps to explain why Duray from the very beginning was emphatically in favor of the program of Eastern conquest. There is a myth out there uh, a myth perpetrated by Anna Bramwell, among other people. She's unfortunately not alone. Any number of scholars have, I don't know why, but a lot of scholars have fallen for this myth about Duray, but it's absolutely a myth. They think, falsely, that Duray was somehow an opponent of plans for Eastern expansion and Eastern conquest. Nothing could be more wrong. Duray from the beginning was fully, wholly, wholeheartedly committed to that program of Eastern expansion. In his mind, that made sense because he thought if we're ever gonna have a truly re-agrarianized Germany, a Germany that has finally gotten over this aberrant phase of industrialization, in his mind, it's an aberrant phase, and has returned to its true calling of working the land and tilling the soil, if we're ever gonna have that, Dare recognizes, we need a whole lot more land. We just don't have enough land given the size of our people circa 1935. So he's fully on board with, yeah, we need to go invade Poland and the Baltic states and other places, take over a bunch more land, and then we'll be able to finally realize his grand dream of a re-agrarianized Germany. So there are ways in which that semi-pseudo-green vision of a future Germany that's bound to the land and filled with farmers without factories and cities. There are some ways in which that was compatible, compatible with the, the notion of an aggressive war of conquest and colonial expansion. And then there are other very practical, very everyday hands-on ways in which they were completely at odds with each other. You mentioned the, so the crisis earlier. As far as I understand it, the crisis earlier, the 1926 crisis, is at least in part caused by a rising productivity of global agriculture and, and also shipping. So shipping becomes more efficient. There's more food. Um, that means that non-combatant nations during the First World War have produced a huge amount of food. Food prices go down. That means that farmers in Germany are basically left selling out like the bottom of the market, right? So there's a that that's a, that, that's at least as far as I understand it the uh, the real problem here, at least the problem in 1926. Given that there is a secular trend in this period and indeed throughout. The 20th century towards greater productivity and greater efficiency in farming. You know, you could just make more food now, right? right. And it's just easier because of better technology. We know, we understand, and so on. And like the 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 um, the harbor process, right, uh, which allows you to distill nitrogen from right. the air and then produce synthetic fertilizers. It's it's huge huge coming online. Yeah, absolutely massive change. So, yeah. why would you need more land, given that you can increase the productivity of a given? Is it simply a kind of a ideological belligerence that it simply happens to align with something else um with the other imperative which is to war so i'm going to quote some timothy schneider timothy schneider is a um a kind of a liberal american historian uh who wrote a book called black earth um whose main contention in the opening at least of that book is that hitler's ecology what he understands as hitler's understanding of the na nature is that the world fundamentally could not change um and that therefore um there simply was scarcity. Scarcity was just a fact. And therefore, any attempt to get around that scarcity by, for example, distilling nitrogen from the air and therefore producing artificial fertilizer, therefore increasing the agricultural productivity, therefore reducing you know, food problems, um, these just simply could not be. And the reason why it could not be is because it reduced conflict between the races. And so Hitler's kind of worldview is like dominated by um, a move towards conquest. Lots of people think this is unconvincing. Um, lots of people have criticized uh, Snyder for lots of various things. Um, what do you think about this? Is this a is this a reasonable kind of way of thinking about, um, yeah, the relationship between ideology and practical uh, processes in the world, and you know, uh, derived from militarism? Is this a reasonable way of thinking about it? I don't know. My answer would be yes and no. Snyder's a really interesting historian. He's he's done this all along. His his last two books before that were equally provocative, sort of large canvas arguments. He's very comfortable arguing, uh, unlike most historians, Snyder is very comfortable arguing outside of his own little box. Many of us, many, many professional historians vastly prefer to stay within our 
extremely narrow area of specialization. He, he will have none of that. Uh, so he's happy to, to toss out these bold, provocative theses and then just watch the ensuing frenzy and see what see what survives and what doesn't. The way that uh, that that way the way that that approach I think gets things right is that people like Himmler, people like Hitler, people like Dare, to name three top Nazis, really were so committed to their own ideologies. Now, they each had three different ideologies. Those, those three figures are not identical, although Himmler and Dore were very close in the earlier years, and obviously they're both working for Hitler, so they have enough uh, commonalities. But those are three Nazis, three top Nazis, who really did view the world entirely through an ideological lens. Everything that they did and thought and said was refracted through a strongly formed worldview. So to that extent, I'd say, sure, Hitler's ability to make sense of the of, of whatever information is trickling through to him in the first place. Keep in mind, by the time you're a, an established dictator in the Third Reich, your sources of information have already been vastly stripped down. God knows what kind of information was making its way up to him at that point. But whatever information is trickling through to him, he's going to interpret it through a a strongly ideological uh, worldview. Same for Dere, same for Himmler. The place I would disagree with someone like uh, Timothy Snyder with that kind of analysis is it fails to recognize how dynamic Hitler's worldview was. Hitler was not beholden to a static worldview. Hitler was in the grip of a genuinely creative uh, a, a creative worldview that kept generating more and more utterly illusory, but still for Hitler, very, very real possible scenarios. And I think that dynamism matters. I think that dynamism, in fact, helps to explain how did a group as marginal as the Nazis, how in God's name did they possibly take power in one of the most modernized and advanced countries on the face of the earth. I think we need to understand the dynamism and not just the supposedly static nature in order to even make sense of basic questions like that. That's fantastic, yeah, I, I, I really agree. That's a, that's a really good uh, response. Um, so this is the blood and soil version of reactionary ecology. That's right. But I mentioned at the beginning that you, uh, well, you mentioned, I think, that you're a kind of historian of, of reactionary ecology writ large or reactionary environmentalism writ large. Um, so that does not just come in blood and soil variants. Absolutely. After the Second World War, the far right is reconstituting itself in lots of different ways. Is there a fundamental break there? Or does the break happen at a different time? Or is there not really a break between the different forms of rights, uh, of kind of reactionary ecology that happen after the Second World War? Is there, or, or how, do you, how do you see it being split up? How do you see it being kind of like fractionated? Sure. Or are we simply seeing like different kind of tendencies come in that weren't previously associated with reactionary politics that are basically entirely novel? So someone like maybe Paul Ehrlich or something, I don't know. Good example. Uh, I think there's a very important break in 1945 or in the latter half of the 1940s. Bre historical breaks like that take a, take a while to filter, to, to work themselves out, to filter through. Uh, but yes, I do think that break is substantial and real. I don't think it's an I don't think it's an optical illusion when those of us in the 21st century look back and notice something's different on the far right scene after the later 1940s than it was from say roughly 1905 up through 1945. But even though there is a, a genuine break in my view, there are still very important elements of continuity in part because some of those people are still alive. They may be in prison. Dare has to spend a couple of years in prison. He gets, he gets an extraordinarily light sentence at, at, at Nuremberg. And then he dies just a couple of years after he's released. Dare dies in 1953 already. So he's not around that long. But during the time that he is around, including the time that he's still in prison, he is busily organizing a new organic farming association. He's come up with a different name for it. He knows he can't get away with using the term blood and soil anymore, a term that Dare did not invent, but that he did largely popularize. He knows he can't call it blood and soil, Blut und Boden in German. So instead he calls it Mensch und Heimat, man and homeland or human and, I don't know how to translate Heimat, human and the land that you occupy. He means the exact same thing as he meant before <laughs> blood and soil. He's just switched out the terms. So Dare, even up to his death in 1953, he's still trying to figure out how can we get a, 
a, a vibrant organic farming movement off the ground in Germany that will help us restore his generally historically illusory notion of a, an agrarian Germany that lived in harmony with the landscape, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe a better example in terms of those continuities before and after 1945, a guy we haven't mentioned yet is Alvin Seifert. Uh, I'll, I don't know how to say his name in English. Alvin Seifert, I guess. Seifert, yeah. <laughs> Let's get it. <laughs> Seifert in, in German. And Seifert's a, a really fascinating character. If when When people ask me, in what ways is the term ecofascism actually useful? Because I, I tend to use that term in a more narrow sense than some others do. Seifert is the guy I come up with. He's the, he is the very model of an ecofascist in the German context during the Nazi era. His title during the Nazi era is Reich Advocate for the Landscape. That's the actual title that Hitler gives him in 1940. Um, so he's, a, he's an important enough guy. He's not at the level of Dere. He's, not a, he's never a minister, but he's a pretty important figure for a lot of what the so-called green faction of the Nazis are doing. After 1945, he gets off even lighter than Dere. He doesn't spend any time in prison. He goes through this farcical denazification process, which basically says, yeah, you're fine. Go back and do whatever you were doing. Go teach go teach your courses on plants and farming at your university outside of Munich. And then he becomes, especially in the later 1950s and into the 1960s, he becomes a really important, almost like a, almost like a grandfather figure to the rebirth of an environmental movement in Germany after World War II. Even though everyone knows this is Alvin Seifert. He was the, he was the right advocate for the landscape up until 1945, that has, a, that has somehow failed to damage his reputation among other environmentalists. He writes a book about compost, which becomes almost like what, it's like the Bible of the, of the early revival in the, especially the 1960s and 1970s, the revival of everyday environmental consciousness in Germany. So he's not a, he's not a minor, minor figure. He's a pretty influential guy. And just the fact that he covers both of those bases, that he had this very, um, conspicuous position under the Nazis, trying to protect the landscape as he understood it, and that he ends up being a really important influence on the reemergence of a post-war German environmental movement, that it's the exact same person. I think that tells us something important. The break that happens in 1945 is absolutely crucial, but it doesn't just magically paper over those continuities. You mentioned earlier that you use the term ecofascism narrowly, but you nevertheless continue to use it. Correct. I'm kind of wondering, there are some people who argue that the term should not be used at all. The term is not that's actually right. useful. And I think that's, a, I, I'm, I'm kind of sympathetic to that argument, at least in some, yeah. in some senses. I think that yeah. the term ecofascism now is a marker of a kind of anxiety rather than a marker of political position. It's, it's a marker about a kind of future that is dominated by authoritarianism, that is dominated by um, the, the wielding of environmental politics in favor of an authoritarian like kind of clampdown. I think that's what people mostly use it to mean. Um, and therefore they're trying to hunt for little bits of what seem like nature politics in the contemporary far right uh -huh. to see how these things are going to explode. You may su <laughs> suggest that I'm also guilty of this. Yes. But um, I think that the I, there's, there's a way in which we can kind of diffuse that anxiety, not by saying, oh, it's all okay. There will not be a kind of environmental future that is dominated by authoritarianism. But by saying there are forms of authoritarianism that one can that doesn't you don't need to describe in the same way as you would describe fascism, because actually it obfuscates it. It makes it really unclear what the thing is that you're talking about. What fascism actually um, is is a really quite particular form of that of, of far authoritarianism, and we don't need that term necessarily. But so, where would you say that the use of the term ecofascism is warranted? That's an excellent question. I, I really like the formulation you gave a minute ago, Sam, that in too many ways that term by now, in the now in the third decade of the 21st century, that term too often reflects a kind of widespread anxiety rather than re legitimate anxiety, but rather than reflecting critical comprehension. And that's what I think we want our terms to do. We, we, we want the concepts that we use to give us greater critical purchase on the realities we are trying to make sense of. So to the extent that a term like ecofascism does that, 
to the extent that it helps us make better sense of the reality we see around it, I'm, I'm obviously in favor of use it because I've used it. I, I think I need to take partial personal responsibility for having played a semi-important role in popularizing uh, that term. Janet and I uh, both, when we, when, we, when we came up with that term as the title of our book back in 1995, I don't think we anticipated how, how the term would take off, but I, I think we both recognized that, yeah, that book played a, played, a, played a part in that process. For what it's worth, I have had an ambivalent relationship to the entire concept of ecofascism from the very beginning. When Janet Beale and I first started hatching the book project back in 1993 already, the book was published in the summer of 1995, but as with any book, as you know, it takes a while to germinate. So we first, she and I first started talking about it in 1993. And at that point, I wanted to title the book, The Politics of Purity which is a title that I still kind of, I still kind of like that title. Maybe someday I'll use that title for one of my own books, I don't know. But she, Janet was, um, bless her soul, Janet had more experience with uh, these things. She, um, she'd done more publishing projects and she sort of calmly explained to me, Peter, actually for what we want to do, it's not the best title. Maybe the better title is the one that we eventually then ended up on, which was Ecofascism Lessons from the German Experience. So I, I wasn't even, at the beginning, I wasn't even necessarily fully on board with using that title. And as you mentioned, the very beginning of our program, the title that I gave to my chapter in that book 26 years ago, it didn't include the term ecofascism. My, the title that I used was fascist ecology. I then used the term ecofascism a couple of times in the, in the body of the chapter itself. But I begin that chapter by trying, my very first paragraph in that chapter, attempts to sort of caution my left readers against overinflated uses of terms like fascism. So I've, I've never been 100% comfortable with this term that my, that my name has become associated with, with the notion of ecofascism. And you're also absolutely right. There are a number of newer, uh, in some cases, younger scholars today, scholars and activists today, who have made some pretty compelling arguments, even if they haven't fully convinced me yet. I think they put a, they put a pretty powerful case out there that Ecofascism isn't the best umbrella term. So people like Balsha Lubarda, Bernhard Faulkner, they're making a really interesting argument. Lubarda's proposal is far-right ecology. He thinks that would be a better umbrella term, and I'm comfortable with that term. I use an even broader umbrella term. For, for a decade and a half now, my umbrella term has been simply right-wing ecology, which is even, even a larger uh, 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 species, class, genus, what phylum, whatever it is, than far-right ecology. I think the term ecofascism is best reserved for a much more specific set of circumstances. I would say basically a, a movement or an individual or a political current. I think it needs to fulfill two distinct criteria for us to be able to call it actually ecofascist. And my two criteria would be, on the one hand, there has to be some sort of genuine commitment to a politics of nature, however understood. I don't want to make that criterion too uh, narrow, but some sort of actual dedication to an environmental politics, not just as rhetoric, not just as nice imagery, but were, were, were they actually mean it and where they show us that they mean it through the stances that they take. So we need a, a, a genuine uh, ecological component there and we need a genuine fascist component. I am not the kind of radical leftist who uses, I'm very much not the kind of radical leftist who uses the term fascist as an empty epithet to describe anything that's vaguely right that we really don't like. I think that is a uh, a, a really bad way to use a term like that. Fascism means something. Now I will concede to you that we can't really entirely agree on exactly what it means. I, I teach graduate seminars every once in a while where we spend five straight months trying to figure out what does the term fascism actually mean? And we never figure it out. We never get to an agreement, but still we can identify at least some core features that fascist groups and movements and currents have had over time. If you have a phenomenon that has both of those features, it's actually fascist and actually environmental, then I think we can use the term like ecofascism. If instead what you have is some form of vaguely environmental politics that's on the right and it's authoritarian, or it's on the right and it's highly nationalist, 
or it's on the right and it has racist elements and xenophobic elements mixed in with it. I would say until we have more specifics there, until we can tie it into actual fascist currents, I would say call it something like right-wing ecology or Lubarda and Faulkner's proposal of far-right ecology. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think that's a reasonable proposal. I should also say that 12 Rules for What, this podcast, does know what fascism is, but unfortunately it's behind the paywall. So if you want to find out, then you've got to... Um, uh, yeah, you've got a, 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 a sign us our Patreon. <laughs> you've got a forthcoming book, which is called right. Ecology Contested. Correct. What is there to be contested in ecology? And why is ecology so open to contestation? My answer to the first question is absolutely everything. Everything about ecology, politically speaking, has always been open to contestation. And that's what I think is simultaneously fascinating about the politics of ecology and also, and also maddening about the politics of ecology. The, for what it's worth, the, the full title of the book, which I, I'm now told will appear in early September. I hope that's true. I, it's not out of my hands. It's in the publisher's hands, but they think it's going to come out on September 2nd or something like that. The full title is Ecology Contested, Environmental Politics Between Left and Right. So I'm trying to convey with the subtitle the kinds of contestation that I have in mind. If we take a purely historical approach, which we shouldn't, we should take a we should take an activist approach. We should take an approach that makes the most sense of our current reality. But since I happen to be a historian, I'm also I'm also drawn to the historical background. And from a purely historical perspective, if you look back far enough, if you go back to the 1870s, let's say in whatever country you're looking at, you can go back further, of course. But let's say the last three decades of the 19th century, whether that's in a North American context, in a UK context, in a uh, German context, what have you, you find strands of environmental concern that are across every possible point on the political spectrum that cover the far left, the far right, the center, the moderate left, the moderate right. There are forms of, envir of genuine environmental concern that can be tagged to every imaginable political position. And it takes a long while for that sort of chaotic political profile of the early environmental movement, it takes a long while for that to settle out and for people to sort of think through and figure out, wait, where, where, where do we think environmentalism actually fits on the political spectrum? If you posed that question, where does environmentalism fit on the political spectrum in say 1925, it would depend on who you were, what your own politics were. It would depend strongly on where you were. 1925 in Stuttgart is very different from 1925 in Manchester or Birmingham versus 1925 in San Francisco. But it would be an entirely reasonable response to that question 100 years ago now to say, oh, environmentalism? Yeah, that's something that the elitist and authoritarian sectors of the right feel most strongly about and have made the most political hay out of. That's where the Madison Grants uh, of the world come from with their eugenics and their racism and racism. And oh, by the way, we also founded the Save the Redwoods League and uh, what have you. It would be an entirely rational response. Whether you met that admiringly or critically, it would have been true. What happens after the 1960s is, maybe I should say from the 1960s onwards, is there's this powerful shift toward the left where environmental issues in, at least in the global north, I can't, I can't speak with any uh, uh, solidity about what's going on in the global south in that uh, sense, but during that period from the 1960s onwards in, in so-called Western societies, strong shift of environmental issues that are increasingly associated with the left. They are seen as progressive. They are seen as at the very least liberal, if not more uh, radical. And it becomes increasingly hard for people up through the 1990s. It becomes hard for a lot of people who are on the left to even remember, gosh, it hasn't always been that way historically. And it's only with the last generation or so of the, the new, the, the re-rising of far-right elements that have now become, certainly over the last half decade, have become part of everybody's consciousness, unfortunately, because they've had massive successes in various parts of the world, with that reemergence of an organized far right that gets a lot of public attention, finally now a lot of other people on the left 
are starting to take seriously that long-standing tradition of right-wing versions of environmental politics. So part of the project that I try to pursue in this uh, new book that's going to come out a few months from now, Ecology Contested, I try to look at why is that the case? What is it about ecological issues and environmental themes that makes them so politically volatile, that makes them available for appropriation by everybody from the radical right to the radical left and everyone in between. And I try to puzzle out that stuff. And I have to tell you right now, I don't come to any great brilliant answers in the book. I don't really have a solid theoretical explanation for that phenomenon, but I do offer a whole lot of concrete empirical examples. The, the book is filled with any number of lesser known instances of right-wing and left-wing engagements with environmental issues that I think deserve more attention than they've gotten so far. Fantastic. Sounds like a really good read. Uh, I'm uh, very looking, much for looking forward to it. Um, you described in your article, Fascist Ecology, Volkish politics as a pathological response to modernity. Um, how should we relate to modernity? Oh, wow. Excellent question. When I described Volkish politics as a pathological response to modernity, what I was trying to convey was two things at once. One, Volkish thinkers were responding to a real set of crises. They were not making up the crisis that they were responding to. They weren't imagining it. It wasn't a, a figment of their, you know, delusory thought process. Those were real crises. The, the, the ways in which the processes of increasing industrialization and urbanization, the increasing technologization, which is not a word, the increasingly technological nature of our everyday lived reality. People who were alive at the turn of the 20th century, people who lived from 1899 into 1901 in places like Germany and the United States and Great Britain, those people watched that process unfold before their very eyes. So when they viewed a series of social crises, those crises were real. What I mean by a pathological response to modernity was the answers that groups like the Volkish currents came up with, the answers were irrational. Their answers did not, in fact, help anybody make better sense of the actual, very real crises that their societies were facing. Instead, what they did was they built up this entirely fictitious edifice. They built up a whole ideology that they thought would explain the, the straits that their societies found themselves in, but that in fact failed to explain anything at all, and instead invented a series of culprits who had virtually no real world connection to the problems that they were facing. And that's the kind of pathological response to modernity that I think we can trace across many other societies. It is absolutely not unique to Germany at all. The Volkisch phenomenon happens to be a prominent German example of that much broader dynamic. And the non-pathological response? What would, oh, I'm sorry, that was your original question. That's right. Uh, my apologies, and you're absolutely right. Not, I would say non-pathological responses plural. I, I, my, for myself, I take a, I always have, all my adult life, I've taken a radical, or tried to take a radical left approach to these questions. I've been an anarchist all my adult life, a radical ecologist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my own answers to the, to better responses to modernity would be, well, we're going to have to eventually dismantle capitalism. There's no way we can, in my view, there's no way we can possibly have an ecologically sustainable society as long as capitalist economic structures are the predominant ones on the planet. We're going to have to, I think, I'm the kind of uh, anti-authoritarian leftists, the kind of anarchist leftists who thinks we're going to have to eventually dismantle the structures of the state if we ever want to achieve a, an ecologically sustainable society. For that matter, if we want to achieve a socially desirable society, so I have a, I have a very, uh, I have a very demanding set of responses that I would say we're going to need to very seriously consider to to have a non-illusory uh, response to the crises of modernity. But I also want to make clear, I don't see any reason to expect anyone else 
to necessarily adopt that full-on radical program. I would be perfectly happy if mainstream liberals and progressives said, you know what, this climate change thing, it tells us something important about the underlying structures of our society. I don't know exactly what it tells us yet about those underlying structures, but it's a signal that we can't just keep going on with things as they are and having a few minor cosmetic reforms to make us feel a little better. If the climate change crisis has that continual effect on mainstream liberals and progressives, where they start to question more and more and go deeper and deeper into the underlying systemic structures that keep a, a modern society like in the United States today, in the UK today, in Germany today, that keep those societies going, that will make me happy, regardless of whether they come to an anti-capitalist uh, position or not. Do you think there's something in particular that, that reactionary ecologies will learn from climate change? So you said that there was a kind of a, a questioning that would go on on the left, but is there a question that would go on on the right? What should we be looking out for in the future? They, the, the, the right is, the, the far right in particular, is just as variegated as the far left is. Anybody who spent some time on the far left knows there's so many different varieties of far left politics. We do not all just magically agree on stuff. And the exact same thing is true at the far right. If there are leftists listening to your show who think of the far right as some sort of monolith, I beg you to reconsider. It is anything but monolithic. The far right is full of contentious intra far right arguments going on right now. And many of those arguments, as it happens, are about environmental issues. There are about a dozen other things too, but a lot of the big ones right now are about things like how do we respond to climate change? I recognize, I absolutely recognize there is a huge swath of the right especially the more established and traditional forms of the right in, uh, in English-speaking countries around the world that is still stuck in pure climate denial. I, I absolutely uh, recognize that 100%. But the further to the right that you move, the more, the more you move to the far right and the radical right, the more you see, well, you see people on the far right obviously accepting the reality of climate change. What they try to do is offer what they see as a right-wing response to that reality. And it almost always comes down to blaming immigrant communities. Somehow or other, that's always gonna be at the core of a far-right answer for those people on the far-right who do take things like climate change seriously. So what I see as part of our job, for those of us who see ourselves as on the left and take the environmental crisis seriously, I think we have an obligation to try to understand why is it that people on the far right immediately think of immigrants whenever they think of climate change. What's the logic that's going on there? And how can we on the left disrupt that logic? How can we point towards a politics that simultaneously takes the climate challenge as seriously as anyone can possibly take it, but that also says we are a movement that welcomes absolutely everybody regardless of their country of origin, regardless of their citizenship status, regardless of the language that they speak, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their religious and cultural affiliations, we are a movement, a radical left-wing emancipatory climate change movement that welcomes everybody into our ranks. And the last thing that we're gonna do is blame immigrant communities for the ravages of the, of the climate that places like the United States and Germany and the UK are actually primarily responsible for. That's an excellent rallying cry. Thank you so much. This has been a, a, an enormous pleasure for me. Thank um, you, Sam. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed that, then you can help support the podcast on Patreon. All the support we get means a lot to us, and it really does help us grow this project. So that's patreon.com slash 12 rules for what, and you can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Thanks a lot, and I will see you very soon. I'm Kami. And I'm Franz. And together we are co-hosts of the Doomer vs. Bloomer podcast on the Channel Zero Network. Every week I'm going to complain about how the world is fucked. Things are definitely going to get worse before they get better. And we're all probably going to die. And I disagree with Kami and think that having hope is important. We can th make things better, but only if we believe we can and put in all the effort we're able to into organizing against capitalism in the state. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> That's the core of our podcast, y'all. It's our shtick. We disagree. <laughs> uh, find our show on SoundCloud or whenever, wherever you find podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Doomer v. Bloomer.
12 rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah.